Delauded! I'm Robert Evans. This is Behind the Bastards, a podcast that is always opened by me shouting out the name of my favorite painkiller, Delauded. Oh, it's good stuff. Why? I'm secret- <laughs> because I'm hopeful because Sophia just got mailed a bunch of knives by our fans, and now I'm kind of hoping that some fans will send me a bunch of Delauded anonymously in the mail. Can we also say that Mama loves Darvaset? So. Oh, Darvaset. Yeah, it's the good <laughs> shit. Consider yeah, consider that. Oh, I, I, and honestly, I can't think of a better idea during a time in which a lot of people are dying from uh, fentanyl overdoses and tainted pills than asking strangers to send us random medication in the mail. That's just good thinking. Again, that- podcast daddy and podcast mama <laughs> love to gamble. Everyone yeah. knows this. We like to roll them bones, baby. <laughs> I got a um, a coffee cup, an Eat the Rich coffee cup. It's actually sitting next to me right now from a fan re- recently. But it came in packaging that I've never seen. It, the packaging made sense in retrospect, but it was like a rounded a box with rounded edges made entirely out of styrofoam that was like taped up and had very official looking labels on it and it looked like the packaging you'd put in for through like a vial of of medication or like like mm. fucking bacterial samples or something so i was looking at this package like should i open this what the fuck is in this thing and That's it just weren't out to be getting a cup. all these knives i was like yeah. oh this could really be a terrible package to open uh, most of these did not have na- names on them, and I respect that because, mm-hmm. you know, the government doesn't need to know what we're sending to each other. Yeah. Anonymously and, send your favorite creator's weapons in the mail. That's a And these thing. knives were amazing. I just did a uh, little tour of the knives for, you got some uh, great for Robert great and Sophie. Knives. There's that amazing uh, U.S. Marine Corps knife. The K-Bar. Yeah, the yeah K-bar. that's a good knife. You can fuck wow. some shit up with a K-Bar. That's the kind of knife if you nice gotta, like, jab your way outside of a car. Nice-ass leather holster. Like, mm-hmm. yes, I love it. Thank you so much. Someone sent a tiny miniature knife for, mm-hmm. like, little, little baby miniatures. Knife. A little baby knife for stabbing yeah. tiny babies. For stabbing little, little fetuses. Yeah. Take it, t- take it from a fetus knife. It loves it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's the kind of knife that, like, like babies young enough to be legally aborted in the state of Texas would use in a knife fight. (laughs) Yes. To try to fight the people that will not give their mother's rights. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) I got two loose knives that came with a collection of other things, like a bag of matzah and you know, yeah, that was weird. Thank you. That was, I love that guy. Yeah. So just like some, some maniac in a a Midwestern state (laughs) sent you a sack with loose knives, matzah, a cigarette. It was incredible. Hey, hey, it was multiple notes. Yeah. It was a lot of notes. They were all very sweet and told Mm -hmm. me to take care of myself and my friends and family Mm -hmm. with these loose knives. And (laughs) now that is the name of honestly (laughs) my new band loose knives. When you walked me through that, us us through that package, that is the proudest I've ever been of my fans. That was, that was an incredible way to send a gift to somebody. Just loose knives with a cigarette in a sack. One rolling paper. (laughs) Mm-hmm. And a single three rolling loose paper matches. Yes, loose bitch. matches. Please, thank you. <laughs> what an amazing! What a so, hero! Mm. <gasps> Someone sent me lavender bath products along with That's a tiny nice knife that Love goes that. on my keychain. Mm-hmm. Someone else sent me. Didn't a they knife also that send that like the- a key? That yeah. I can sneak into an airport, and yeah, that they person specifically knows said best. this doesn't. This isn't visible on X rays. <laughs> God, that's some queen shit. You know what I mean? Oh, God. Thank you. That's, you know, having, when people, when people send you stuff like that in the mail and just like, here's how you can smuggle a knife on an airplane, stranger that whose content I like, that lets me know that we're reaching the right demographic. I feel seen, you mm -hmm. know? Absolutely. Absolutely. Beautiful And when I was telling Robert before this, I was like, yeah, I used to fly with a knife in my purse all the time on airplanes and not because I was like trying to prove a point or anything. I just always carry a knife and I would forget to take it out before I flew and they never got it. It took me like 15 times of flying before Mm -hmm. finally someone was like, is that a knife? And I was like, oh, shit. (laughs) <laughs> yes, it is. And then I lost it. But now mm-hmm. I have a K bar, so fuck them. And yep. this time. Make tiny sure you check knife. the K bar. They will probably find that. <laughs> I won't fly with that one. That's just for local stabbings. Okay, that's for local st- that's good. Yeah, you need to have you need to have like like not every knife is suitable for stabbing people in every situation. Like if you're gonna this shank is- somebody in an airport bathroom that's past security, you want the key knife. 
Exactly. Exactly. But, but a K bar, you know, it's it's a it's for a different thing. It's a different kind of vibe. Mm-hmm. It's a different kind of, you know, stabbing. The K bar is the knife that like if you have to uh uh in in the style of a uh, uh parable of the sower hike on foot from southern California up to Oregon in order to save yourself during the climate apocalypse and crash in my uh compound. That's the knife you take with you to stab people on the road. I was thinking more of like Cheryl Stray Strayed's like wild, you know, like I'm on the doing the Appalachian Trail, mm-hmm. you know, maybe I stab something knife. to eat. Maybe mm-hmm. I stab a man who who wants to get in this pussy. You know, you mm-hmm. never know what happens. And out you there. could eat him, too. You know, Waste <laughs> not. Um, I always yeah, say you think I would stab a man without eating him. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> Robert, Ethics. the heart first while it's still beating. Everyone knows that. <laughs> mm-hmm. That's how you get his power. <laughs> and then we slice up his butt cheek meat. Mm-hmm. That's the best meat. Into some steak tartare. Mm-hmm. Mama's I imagine gonna human eat. cheek because like beef cheek is delicious. I imagine people's cheeks would be pretty good too. Um, I don't think they have as much like fatty loveliness, but probably they're not bad. Yeah, they're probably pretty. They're probably good. like you know when you eat like a fish head, mm-hmm. and you get like all the parts out of the head, and they're like delicious. I mean, we should probably ask one of our fans to just send. To us. <laughs> please don't do please, please don't please, Robert, please send us what sophie come on just you just you just, said you said we're not allowed to I talk cu- about I, doing a 9-11 you just said we're know not that allowed I've to cut what robert just said for safety reasons sophie Look, robert we're already getting sent knives that yeah. you very send aptly more said are could be used in a 9-11 and I feel yeah, like you could do a 9-11 with some of those. I'm nines, saying for sure. that's enough for us. We don't need to encourage. You're right. We can get our own. Exactly. That's what the knives are for. Mm hmm. And in the meantime, my K bar is for like local stabbings, like your farm to table kind of mm-hmm. human farm to meat. table stabbings. For yeah. Sure. Yeah. And then the other kind of stabbings that are like more. Oh, you got to travel to stab who you want. That's what my little airplane knife is for. Mm hmm. That's good. So, that makes so sense. none of this has anything to do with what we're talking about today, which is ben cryptocurrency. Cool. So, Sophia, burr, burr, burr. I never plan to do an episode on NFTs or cryptocurrency because um, I think it's all very silly. Uh, I am I am not a believer in any of this stuff. But over the last couple of weeks, in spite of myself, I've I've gone down a rabbit hole, specifically in, inspired by some NFT scams that have recently come to light that I just found absolutely fascinating. Um, this is not going to be an episode about a specific bastard. And to be honest, even like the victims here are not people I really feel that bad for um, because they're gambling with money that uh, only exists because it destroys rainforests. Basically, <laughs> like it's like. It, crypto is, I think, b- b- mostly bad. Um, but this show primarily functions by me getting interested in something and then reading about it. And this week, I didn't want to read about Peter Thiel or or some sort of genocide, Ceausescu or whatever. Fair enough. Um, I wanted to read about cryptocurrency, so I did. Um, and the person you can blame this episode on is David Gerard or David Gerard, who wrote a book called Attack of the 50-Foot Blockchain. Um, David is a senior Wikipedia editor. He's a volunteer spokesperson for Wikipedia. He's also an author and a crypto expert who is a no coiner, which is somebody who doesn't is involved in the cryptocurrency world, often reporting on it, but does not actually hold any himself. And he doesn't hold any because he he seems to pretty much think it's all bullshit. Um, He is widely despised in the cryptocurrency community. But as far as I can tell, he is uh, very knowledgeable um, and he's a good writer. Uh, I recommend the book heavily. Um, He's also pro some of the fundamental ideas that are behind cryptocurrency, which I actually kind of am as well. At the beginning of his book, he cites a quote from Bitcoin creator Satoshi Nakamoto's original manifesto or white paper, whatever you want to call it, laying out Nakamoto's basic goal of the Bitcoin project. Quote, a purely peer-to-peer version of electronic cash would allow online payments to be sent directly from one party to another without going through a financial institution. So you can see, like, right, just that basically, if you take out everything that's happened since, if someone were to, like, tell you that idea, you know, back in 2005 or whatever, hey, this is what I want to make, that's not unreasonable, right? It, 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 like, maybe that's just the libertarian in me, but, like, I get why you would want that. Real quick, 
We did not do an intro, did we? <laughs> Why would we do an intro? We did an intro. We talked about knives. <laughs> I just wanted to make sure Sophie's faces were all covered. <laughs> Everyone knows who you You're are. Good. You're Sophia Alexandra. Normally we talk so about horrible dead baby things, but this week we started by talking about knives and cryptocurrency. Yeah, and then you said, I, I look, you lured me here under false pretenses. Um, I thought there would be dead babies. Instead, you were like, we're talking about NFTs. And I'm like, oh, not Sophia, on these fucking titties. How about and this? You were like, that's not what NFT stands for. Cryptocurrency is incredibly environmentally wasteful. Every individual popular cryptocurrency uses more uh, electricity and emits more carbon per year than many nations. Yes. That leads to horrific climate change, which kills a shitload of babies. Tens of millions of babies are going to die additionally every year as the world war- warms You're and as air pollution increases. You're just saying that to make me feel better. Sophia, I guarantee You're you there are mountains that, of babies Robert. being killed by this. No, mountains of them. I don't believe so, it. Sophia, I I will I will for the for the next year, every time there's a horrible natural disaster that affects babies, <laughs> I'm gonna send you a picture. I'm gonna like I'm gonna ba- go tr- little, little, little tiny baby hurricane. <laughs> yeah, little baby oh, hurricane sure hurricanes die. that just oh, affect in ICU warts. <laughs> <laughs> oh we're and Nick uh, you oh we're mm-hmm. tinies. We scotten all the incubators. Mm-hmm. Yeah, tropical storm widow bitty baby. <laughs> Yeah, I don't think anyone's sending me knives after this. <laughs> no. Sophie, but like, so, okay, cryptocurrency. Yes. The basic idea, like, that Nakamoto was going for behind Bitcoin, that doesn't sound entirely unreasonable to me. A way for people to send electronic money directly without using a bank or without, like, go, you know, involving a government, right? Like, I don't have a fundamental issue with that idea. In fact, I think there's there's reasons for which it could be value valuable. Now, I'm was a libertarian most of my life. I'm kind of more on the anarchisty spectrum now. Um, and I don't really like Same. large, powerful, centralized institutions. So, yeah, so you could see, like, if someone were to, again, if Bitcoin wasn't a thing, if all of the shit that's happened wasn't a thing, someone said, hey, I'm working on this idea, you might have thought, like, oh, that that sounds like a, a, a neat experiment to try. It's worth giving a shot. Um, one of the other things that Nakamoto was talking about and that a lot of early people who were into cryptocurrency talked about was the promise that it would provide an option for people who are unbanked, which is folks who, for a variety of reasons, maybe their location, the nation that they live in, you know, the level of poverty that they have, whatever, maybe the fact that like, there's a lot of people in places like India who don't legally exist because they were, you know, of where they were born. There's just nobody like keeping track of people there. Um, like their identities often like tied up in the community that they live in rather than like a bunch of government documents. Um, So a lot of these people aren't going to be able to have an account with a financial institution. So one of the ideas was that, well, if you have some sort of electronic currency that doesn't rely on a government or a financial institution, it would provide an option for those people. Um, And specifically an option to do like microtransactions. So like sending small bits of money, you know, from one place to the other. Um, None of this has wound up happening. Cryptocurrency does none of this. Like absolutely none well, of this. Well, I was going to say, that's <laughs> the thing is if that's what it was, that would be tight. That's mm-hmm. not what it is. And no. um, it's kind of like when I read about that ship that was like an independent nation and you can buy your like thing on it with crypto. Mm-hmm. And then it's like, oh, we didn't realize how hard it is to. It's actually um, very hard to do this. To have a ship <laughs> and uh, a government and uh, infrastructure, but you're in a sh- on a ship. Oh fuck! So it, yeah, it, the idea, like, sure, mm-hmm. that's cool, but you did not think through anything like eating or shitting in no. the sea. Or the laws of the sea or what it takes to actually (laughs) operate a boat of that size. I I actually really like that you brought that up. And the story, for people who aren't aware, there's actually a good article about it. Um, A bunch of like libertarian crypto nerds bought a cruise ship at the start of the pandemic um, and sailed it off the coast of Panama in an attempt to create an independent nation there. And we're basically like selling bunks on the ship. And the idea was that it would be like a perfectly free country. But for one thing... 
you, you can't be perfectly free living uh, in a tiny room on a cruise ship. Like people weren't even allowed to have like microwaves in their room. They didn't have their own kitchens. They were reliant upon like it, was, it was just there it would have been no a nightmare to live there. To be able to do this in a way that is safe. So yeah. to be like, OK, we have to be safe. They're like, you can't have a microwave and whatever, yeah. which is like hilarious when you're like, this is the freest you'll ever be. Yeah. Except for it, you can never cook again. And Welcome you can see, to freedom. <laughs> like, I love the movie Pirate Radio. Um, I think that's yes, what it's called. Is that one too. about those people who live on that boat that and do a pirate? Yes. I, that's my dream. I would love to like live on a big boat with like 20 something of my friends and run illegal media stations. That sounds like the coolest thing you could possibly and do. With everybody your life. has British accents. And everybody's very British. It, it sounds it would be rad as hell. But obviously um the idea anyway it, what, what's it, the reason i think that it's good that you brought this up is that it's a perfect example of what has happened with a lot of cryptocurrency we'll talk about this a little more in a bit but like all of these people are good at one thing and it makes them think they're good at a bunch of other things or at least they could figure it out like these crypto nerds were like really good at making a bunch of money in cryptocurrency and other ways like a lot of them were business owners you know they're the kind of libertarians who did have a skill they made their money doing something um, and they were convincing us that like, well, how hard could it be to like operate a cruise ship? Um, or just, I'll be able to hire somebody to operate it. How complicated could the laws be? And it's like, well, it's a nightmare. And it's the it, same thing with crypto where all these people were like, of yeah. someone that like decorates their house nicely and is like, let's just flip houses. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then they're like, oh no. <laughs> yeah. This is, this I is do horrific. not understand how to do that. I just know how to buy shit off of Wayfair and <laughs> my bad. And <laughs> yeah, I the... should not have tried to be an HGT. <laughs> TV person <laughs> it's you've seen I've seen a lot of the same thing in like the pot industry because I was I was living in and around pot farms during like the height of the marijuana gold rush in California talk and dirty to me Robert a lot of people who like would get in and try to start farms who had like made a bunch of money doing something else something in business or whatever like in the tech industry and would like well now I'm just gonna like I'm gonna be a pot farmer and didn't realize that like because they'd grown like a couple of plants in their house or something. And it's like, no, no, no. Actual pot farming is one of the hardest things you can possibly do. Um, and it, it necessitates very close contact with incredibly date cost. Even if you're like organically uh, using pesticides, you're basically spraying sulfur in amounts that you have to wear like a fucking Tyvek suit. Like it's it's hard. And all of these people like crashed and burned because they had no fucking clue what they were doing. And they couldn't physically handle the demands of running a farm because farming is hard. It's like a lot of these people like, love to like think a, shit is easy from mm -hmm. the outside yeah and yeah it's, it's a human problem it's not anything, just a crypto problem no yeah. everybody thinks something that you don't know shit about from the yeah. side you're like this shit is easy i, I see it a lot it like, like oh the, no the utopian kind of socialist and anarchist communities that i have a lot of you know love for but like a lot of people who are like city kids talking about their dream of like buying land and operating a farm and like i'm farming about an acre right now um, and I am not, I, uh, the, the people who are engaged in the project with me have been doing it a lot longer and are much better at it than I am. And even the little bit that I'm doing is like, it's a shitload of work. And that's like a little bit of land, not even trying to be fully self-sufficient. Like it's all, it's this thing people do is like, I, I don't, I, I, I think that this thing sounds fun. How hard could it possibly be? Oh no, it's a problem. Um, the issue is that like, same if, with a homemaker problem. It's like yeah. the idea, these, you know, a lot of these men have been like, oh, well, like all you do is fucking stay at home and take care of the kids in the house. How hard could this be? And then, like, you know, COVID happened and they had to do it for a little bit. And they were like, oh, my God, what you do is hell. And it's like, yeah, bitch, everybody's job is hard. I don't know what you think an easy job is. Just being rich. Oh, um, is easy. I, I would say CEO, like it's being. That's a, I, think, it. I think I could be a CEO of literally any company yeah. out there and do just. But that's fine. not a job. That's like no. That's like a like what the royalty is in Britain. You know. Yeah, I could. It's I would be a great like Queen of England. Oh my god. Ceremonial. You know. Yeah, I could be a pretty good pope too. I think, but yeah. I anyway, Can we're getting. You be the pope, and I'll be the queen. Absolutely, we can finally destroy the church of england i can't um, wait 
So the issue here, like this is a thing we all do, underestimate how difficult things that we don't have experience with are. Um, it's it's Dunning-Kruger stuff. And it, like, for example, if you and your friends buy five acres of land and realize farming's much harder, you have two options. Either you give up or you actually get better after a while at it and eventually figure it out. Either way, the worst case scenario is like, oh, I... I made a mistake and this is harder than I thought it was. If what you're trying to do is completely recreate a financial system, the mistakes you make will be things like, oh, I've been illegally selling unlicensed securities. Oh, I've been illegally operating as a money transmitting like organization without any of the proper uh, paperwork. And now I found out that I've actually been committing numerous felonies. Oh, what I've been doing for years is actually embezzlement. And I was unaware because I don't understand any of these financial regulations. And I just thought it was easy to 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 recreate all this i thought that because it was cryptocurrency there's no laws around it and actually it's all still regulated the same way the rest of the economy is um and i've been committing numerous crimes which is why a lot of these guys go to jail um yep. <laughs> like a lot of the big crypto dudes um either go to jail or flee the country because yep. th- they either learn or yeah anyway this is what we're talking about here Um, So at the moment, uh, at best, Bitcoin is an extremely volatile speculative commodity that uses an ungodly amount of electricity and is a huge pain in the ass for most people to use. It has not freed any individuals from reliance on centralized bank type businesses. In fact, part one of the things that everyone gets excited about is like Bitcoin's dollar value, you know, shoots up regularly to a high level. But like you're still excited, like it's worth a lot of U.S. dollars. Right. Like it's it, it's a money making scheme to get people rich in actual currency. And the people I know who are smart in crypto have done that. I have a friend who when Bitcoin was like 500 bucks a Bitcoin, he was moving to Europe and he put a lot of his money into Bitcoin with the idea that like, well, I'll move to Europe and I'll sell it for euros and I'll avoid a lot of transfer fees for doing that. Um, and he just kept some of it in there as the price shot up and he did very well. But his goal was always like, well, I don't. I, 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 th- this is an like, you know, a gamble, right? Like, and he's someone who enjoys gambling and that's fine. Like if, if you want to gamble, I don't have an issue with gambling, obviously. Like we do, we sell sports betting and stuff. I, I have no moral problem with gambling. Um, but it's not a functional currency in any meaningful way. It just isn't. It's, um, again, at best, like a very volatile kind of, uh, investment type thing. Um, also, I gotta f- say with like, the environmental footprint that all of us are making every day that's just so fucked up and with corporations not giving a shit and not Mm -hmm. changing anything and the government not giving a shit and not changing anything it's like i mean i understand trying to make money but i just feel like making money from a thing that you know destroys the environment is like another level of like making you feel bad and it's like, yeah, all late stage capitalism makes you feel bad and participating in it. Yeah. But if you know that there's no value to what you're putting money into and the thing they're putting your money into is just made up so that people could make money. And then while it's made up, it's just making the environment worse. Just feel well, like here's one of the things about why. it. I think if when you first got into it, especially if you got into it when it was not worth much, the environmental cost wasn't much. It hasn't always been as bad. So the way that Bitcoin works, right, the thing that gives it scarcity, um, like when you're mining it, when you're doing it, like is you're you're, basically it computers mine it by having to do a bunch of calculations. It's called proof of work. Right. And, And the longer time goes on in order to keep the thing at a steady rate while processing power increases, the calculations get harder. So at the beginning, very little power comparatively was used to mine Bitcoin, but it just, it, it gets hard. Like the, the math the computers have to do gets harder and harder and harder over time. And that increases the amount of electricity that Bitcoin like requires. And I don't think a lot of people thought about it at the time, especially since as as we'll cover, this was just kind of like one of a, at at the start, it was one of a couple of different crypto things people had tried. And like in 2010, I don't think anyone could have guessed that Bitcoin would eventually be drawing more power than dozens of nations. Like it just, because it it didn't start that way. It was kind of like, and when Satoshi Nakamoto created it, it was like an experiment. Like, I I don't even think in, in his mind, it was going to be the final product, the actual cryptocurrency he wanted to create. It was like, let's see if this works and then maybe iterate. Do you think, Hmm. 
Do you think that like the idea that it could possibly become that was even something that people thought through all the way? I don't think so, because there's a number of things that are really, really it's like the about. atom bomb where like yeah. you didn't know that that's what gonna, was going to happen, but then it did and it was fucked. Yeah, there's a bunch of things they would have done differently, like Nakamoto and the like the people who were kind of like getting it off the ground, I think would have done differently if they'd known how successful it would be. For one thing, one of the reasons Bitcoin like can't work as a global currency is that there is a hard cap on the number of transactions worldwide that can ever occur. There can never be more at present than seven Bitcoin transactions per second planet wide, which y- Wait, doesn't explain work. explain why. It's, a ma- it's math shit. Like, I, I, I don't understand the math, but that's the way it works. And people have proposed different ideas for, like, expanding the number of, of Bitcoin transactions that can that can happen. There's kind of, like, ways to basically change the code at a fundamental level. But it hasn't been done. And this handicap means that as Bitcoin has gotten more popular, it has gotten more expensive just to make a transaction. So you have to pay because it takes, like, power and stuff in order to, like, even start a transaction. And you never entirely know when the transaction is going to happen about 20% of them just get like canceled because there's this massive like blockage in terms of actually getting because you have to you have to actually like enter transactions onto the blockchain right that's the whole thing about bitcoin is it's on this thing called the blockchain which is this persistent record of every bitcoin transaction and only so many transactions can get written to the 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 blockchain at a given point in time so it's at about 7 a second right now um which makes it a huge like you can't one of the like people talk about bitcoin Bitcoin being used for drugs and it is it has been on like the silk road and stuff but it's actually like it's it's a thing where individuals will like buy amounts of drugs with it but drug dealers like big name people like hate would never enjoy like use bitcoin for this because you don't know that the transaction's going to go through you don't know when it's going to go through so wait like, let me ask you this is it just like if there's a it's like trying to get tickets to like a hot ass yeah. show or something and yeah, you're trying to type is. into Ticketmaster or whatever the fuck and there's it's like, like a lottery you, almost yeah yeah it's to like be not able happening. to make a and then transaction. if you get it in that exact moment you get your thing and if you don't like you don't yeah yeah it's kind of like that it, it, it's very in a, and again this is because number one when it was invented i don't think nakamoto had any idea that it would ever be this popular and it was not they hadn't thought all this out, right? Because it's a new thing. And the problem is that Do you, you have all these people who are... Do you think any time you invent a new thing that you think what's the least that could happen with it and what's the most that can happen with it? Do you think so? I don't think necessarily you do if you're the kind of person who just thinks this stuff is neat. Like, if you're the kind of math brain engineer type person who just it, it enjoys the intellectual problem of a cryptocurrency, he thought through a lot. There's things about Bitcoin that are very smart. There is a reason it's been as successful as it is and is used as widely as it is. There's a reason why, of all of the different cryptocurrency projects that have existed over the years, Bitcoin is the biggest one. There were things that he did right, but it's also like a guy trying to dream up basically a whole new economic system it was always going to be incomplete and like so no one but of i f- guess like i mean yeah. it's like any kind of and forgive me for making this a science fiction comparison but it's like any science fiction thing right where it's like oh it starts off real good but like you got to think about like right like all the best best things that could happen and the worst things that could happen so i feel like a lot of times Um, I don't know if I buy that these like hyper smart people didn't think about what could happen because I just think that they did and they were like, oh, whatever, we'll worry about it later. Yeah, I mean, maybe. I don't know. And I'm not trying to say that in like a negative way. I'm just trying to think like maybe the excitement of inventing this thing make makes it so that even if you consider what the possibility of the end game is you're just like oh i don't care because this is so exciting yeah i think that's a big part of it i think it's it's nerds being excited about a thing it's like all of social media it's kind of the same thing where like they no one thought through what might happen because they were so excited about like oh can we make this work um and can we get people interested in this thing and that was a more important question than like 
hey, do we do we think we might need to be do, able to do more than seven transactions a second worldwide for this thing? Hey, what if it winds up using more power than multiple entire nations worth of people um, and, and burning down rainforest in order to exist? Like, and again, it's also Bitcoin gets started in 2009, right? Like the technology is in such a different place then that I don't think they they I don't think they necessarily thought, oh, dozens of different like Chinese corporations are going to buy massive mining rigs that are powered by coal plants in order to like mine more yeah. Bitcoin. It was like it's it's true, a guy on a true, project in true, 2009. True. You can't anyway. No, that's that's not, a lot. That's a lot to uh, envision and yeah. <laughs> Um, predict. And we'll, we'll talk about like why, because the fundamental problem in a lot of ways with Bitcoin is that rather than it being what it should have been, it was like, oh, here was an experiment. Here's the ways in which it was successful. Here's the ways in which it's failed. Let's try a new thing. It's still like the thing in cryptocurrency, the biggest thing. And people are, and it's because people are ideologically invested in it. And that is a problem because it's obsolete. It's bad. It's, it's heavily flawed in a number of ways and shouldn't still exist. Like something better should have come along, but people are ideologically Theologically committed to Bitcoin, and um, that's a problem. And we'll get to that problem wait, wait, wait. And more. One thing but, hmm. I know we have to go. Uh, we hmm. have to promote some goods and services, but really mm-hmm. quick before we go, I just want to say that you know, honestly, some of this is like reminding me of what it's like to be a stand-up, right? When you're like trying jokes out, and in the beginning, it's like sometimes you'll say some stuff that ends up being reckless and not something that like you fully thought the implications of. Or, you know, you fully understood was going to be actually what you were trying to say, because you're just trying to say it to figure out what you're saying. And that sometimes is what happens. And I think like the difference is, is like when you decide to let other people. When you decide to commit to that or when you decide to whatever, but like no one's blameless. There's jokes that I know I've done that are like shitty Mm -hmm. before I got to the like the final version of the joke. But I guess it's just so scary that the not final version of a joke for these people is on the scale that ruins rainforests and countries. And that, I think, is wild. And I think the only thing I can compare it to is being like someone like Dave Chappelle, you know, where like (laughs) you put out a big ass special that's just like you being like. I yes. am a committed transphobe and then you Bitcoin, know Bitcoin the Dave Chappelle of currencies. <laughs> yeah, and like Dave Chappelle, it was cooler in 2009. It's true, <laughs> and my heart is breaking, but All right. Speaking goods of goods and services. Dave Chappelle, you know who doesn't create transphobic comedy specials? It's going to be an ad for Netflix. <laughs> yeah, it's made for Oh, no, wait. Fuck. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, here's Netflix. Oh, we're back. So, from the beginning of... Uh, I'm so sorry. So again, I, I think there's there's some some neat promise and some of the ideas that inspired people behind cryptocurrency. But one of the issues with it is that from the beginning, it's been primarily an ideological crusade rather than a quest to actually develop something that's inherently practical. Um, in the book Attack of the 50 Foot Blockchain, Gerard, uh, Gerard quotes Roger Ver, who was an early cryptocurrency advocate, as saying, At first, almost everyone involved did so for philosophical reasons. We saw Bitcoin as a great idea, as a way to separate money from the state. Now, Gerard goes further, explaining that much of the ideological justification for crypto as it exists is tied to uh, what's called cyber libertarianism. And here's how he defines that. Quote, Computer programmers are highly susceptible to the just world fallacy that their economic good fortune is the product of virtue rather than circumstance, and the fallacy of transferable expertise, that being competent in one field means they're competent in others. Silicon Valley has always been a cross of the hippie counterculture and Ayn Rand-based libertarianism, this cross being termed the Californian ideology. Cyber libertarianism is an academic term for the early internet strain of this ideology. Technological expertise is presumed to trump all all other forms of expertise, e.g. economics or finance, let alone softer sciences. I don't understand it, but it must be simple, is the order of the day. And that's that's the issue here, is what we were talking about a little bit earlier. Um, 
And obviously at this point, because I there don't is a understand lot of understand it, but it's simple. It's yeah. kind of like a motto for me in my 20s dating men. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, and that's a, not a bad motto for dating for dating men, uh, especially especially men in your 20s, because we 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 tend to be pretty simple. Um, but so, I'll, it's worth noting here that a lot of people who use crypto now, because there is so much money in it, right, are just are gamblers or or scammers, not particularly believers in the ideology. When we're talking about the ideological part of crypto, it's it's it, it is the backbone still of cryptocurrency. It's a lot of the people making stuff. It's a lot of the people who are like the loudest evangelists. Um, but most of the people who make a lot of money off of crypto aren't. Um, you know, believers in anything, uh, they're in a lot of cases just scammers. They're people committing serious financial crimes to get rich themselves by robbing, robbing people and defrauding them en masse. And that is a huge amount of cryptocurrency. One of the things about it is because there's no state, there's no bank, there's no protection. So like one thing that can happen is if you're doing a Bitcoin transaction and you like type in the address you're sending it to wrong, that money's just gone. Um, it's like if every... Like if if every uh, if every transaction you made was an even worse wire transfer, basically. I mean, um, I've done that on Venmo before, where you send money to someone yeah. who you thought you were sending it to, but it's not the right person. I mean, yeah, but I this guess is, it just Venmo goes has nowhere. the decency to give you money yeah. back, but this ain't gonna happen with your uh, cryptocurrency shit. No. Um, now, one of the things that is frustrating here is that like you have these these true believers in the ideological promise of cryptocurrency and they provide cover for a lot of the scammers often not intentionally but like the fact that there's these people saying no this is like a crusade and we're we're separating money from the state and this is good and a lot of people are able to cloak themselves in that to steal tens of millions of dollars um and and it's it's very profitable to do that for the true believers the quest for a currency free of central control goes back decades cryptocurrency is actually a lot older as an idea than you might guess and in fact paypal was actually founded with the understanding that it would be a perfectly anonymous way to send and receive money without government oversight. In 1999, Peter Thiel told his employees that thanks to PayPal, quote, it will be nearly impossible for corrupt governments to steal wealth from their people through their old means. Now, Thiel wound up Sounds making like it big. Sounds somebody's underestimating governments. Well, and his own greed, because once Thiel gets rich, he stops saying shit like this and he moves on to found the most powerful surveillance company in the world, spying for the federal government on its citizens, multiple federal governments on its citizens. So, like, Again, a lot of these people, even the ones who are ideological, are absolutely willing to, like, turn on a dime if there's money in it. Now, digital currency, though, has a long history philosophically. The idea seems to have originated from a fellow named David Chaum, who was a computer scientist and a cryptographer. In 1982, Chaum wrote a paper titled Computer Systems Established, Maintained, and Trusted by Mutually Suspicious Groups. This was a thought experiment on how to create a trustless form of digital currency. Bitcoin is trustless. The blockchain, all blockchain cryptocurrencies are trustless. And trustless means that you cannot fake either the currency or the transactions, right? It's very, it's not entirely impossible, but it's very difficult to fake a Bitcoin transaction, right? Or to fake a Bitcoin because of the sheer amount of math necessary in order to like make one essentially. And the blockchain is very close to a, uh, a an unalterable record of transactions. So that's what makes it trustless, right? You don't have to trust somebody that like the transactions happening and going through. It's indelibly recorded on this thing. Um, so 1982 is when we kind of have the first person develop the idea for what becomes the blockchain. It's a persistent, unfalsifiable record of transactions. Now, Chaum did try to create his own cryptocurrency in 1995 with a company called DigiCash and a thing called eCash. eCash was supposed to be perfectly anonymous. I'm sorry, and both of those names are so 90s. I know, it's incredibly 90s. This I I imagine he was wearing Jinkos the entire time. <laughs> and and one of those like Scully from X-Files suits with the huge shoulders. Hell yeah, but also do you remember um that LA LA Styles or LA Gear gel? Do you know what I'm talking about? Yes. Yes, mm-hmm. what was it called? I know what you're talking about. I don't We're going to Google yeah. it during the break, but yeah. it was all like neon colors with little bubbles in it. Mm-hmm. And you would put it all over your shit. 
that's the equivalent of this. Yep. Hell yeah. Yeah, that's exactly it. It's the cryptocurrency equivalent of that weird S we all drew on our our binders when we were in middle school. Um, <laughs> yes, I'm sure that the was one the that logo is for a weird reason. Like <laughs> shout out millennials. Kind of, yeah, like kind of like a, a dollar sign, but not. But also why? Yeah, yeah. You know, we yeah. loved it. We did. We absolutely did. So eCash was supposed to be totally anonymous. And the idea of a currency that's transactions couldn't be tracked by a government enticed a lot of powerful people. Um, and there was significant money put behind DigiCash and eCash. David Marquat, uh, who is the co-founder of the venture capital firm August Capital and a former I'm Microsoft sorry, is board Marquat member. Marquat is like a kumquat or like a Yeah, quad? it's kind of M-A-R-Q-U-A-R-D-T. Yeah, yeah, that's a Marquad, that's like maybe? a red kumquat for sure. Yeah, it's like a red kumquat that gives ten million dollars to to David Chaum's cryptocurrency. Also, uh, a kumquat scheme. is what I call your girlfriend. Meow. Wow, <laughs> very irresponsible. <I, laughs> can we get HR on the line, Sophie? <laughs> no, Sophie is not an employee. Sophie is oh, HR, right. and well, guess what? Guess that's she fine, approved then. this fucking message. <laughs> so only one bank agreed to use eCash. They implemented it for micropayments. They're in like Missouri. Uh, the system Damn, was not that popular. that bank is <laughs> less yeah. popular than I was in middle school. <laughs> Fuck. Um, and the, yeah, the system was not popular. It was dissolved after three years. It just didn't like catch on in any way. David yep. blamed this on the fact that the internet had gotten more popular in the late 90s and the ideological and privacy obsessed nerds that he'd written his white papers for were not the bulk of the internet anymore. Quote, as the web grew, the average level of sophistication of users dropped. It was hard to explain the importance of privacy to them. Most people are like, why do I need to learn how to use a whole new weird digital money thing in order to keep my transactions secret? And you know what? To be honest, I'm sure like the if you wanted to like give him the actual like the drug dealer answer, like, no, I care about privacy. That's why I use fucking cash. (laughs) Like, <laughs> there is a perfectly anonymous way to, to, to exactly. transact things. Exactly. No way it's to trace it cash. back to you. It's... That's why drug dealers do everything in cash. <laughs> that is like the funniest thing about this is like, because they're all such fucking nerds. It's like, we have to have a way to like, you know, make transactions that uh, nobody can track. It's like, yeah, you can just use cash. <laughs> like, Stop reinventing the wheel. You know what? It reminds yeah. me that old chestnut about how uh america spent like so much money developing a pen that could write upside down in space Mm -hmm. and russians just use a pencil i don't know if that is that one i don't know if it's real but i'm just saying that's like that old chestnut yeah yeah it, 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 you see that a lot. Now, there is, I will say, as somebody who used cryptocurrency to buy drugs over the Internet, there is one realistic use case for the anonymous currency, which is that if you're trying to buy illegal drugs through the Internet, you can't use cash. Right. You do need an option for that. And and some of these people attempted to provide that in 1996. Some weird libertarians. Wait, wait, invented- tell your girl what kind of drugs you buy. I'll get to that. I'll get to that. Okay, cool. In 1996, some weird libertarians invented e-gold, which was supposedly an anonymous digital currency backed by actual gold. So it was on the gold standard, but it was crypto, which to be (laughs) honest, at least makes more sense than like bitcoins based on like the scarcity of being able to perform hard math calculations thing. I don't know. Whatever. Good luck um, getting someone to send you gold in exchange for your crypto, though. Well, yeah, I don't know that that ever happened. But like modern cryptocurrency, it was way less anonymous than its founders claimed. E-Gold handed over their records to law enforcement when requested. Nevertheless, it was popular for more than a decade among people who wanted to buy drugs over the internet from shady Canadian pharmaceutical websites and needed some hint of deniability about it. <laughs> I can confirm that E-Gold worked pretty well for this because um, allegedly people I may or may not have known slash been used it to purchase things like 2CI and 5MEO MIPT and 2CT7 and 2CTE and all sorts of fun shogun chemicals over the internet. Wait, 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 wait. Can you tell the lay woman what that is? They're different hallucinogens that a guy named uh, Alexander Shulgin invented and tested on he and his wife and wrote books about and they're pretty rad for the most wait, part. How, how do they relate to mushrooms and or acid? Well, some of them are flanephalamines, which I believe mushrooms are a flanephalamine too. So some of them actually are, like some of them are kind of like synthetically similar to mushrooms. Some of them are very different. Like 2CI is like nothing else I've ever experienced. They're just chemicals that, it's very visual in a way that like, it's visual in a way that like when you watch like how acid and stuff is depicted on TV, 
it's not actually like that. Acid isn't like it, the crazy. No, I've done acid a stuff. lot, but I'm yeah. asking like, is it more well, like? That's what I'm explaining. So. You know how, like, when TV shows are trying to depict an acid trip, they always show, like, all these psychedelic weird colors and strange mm-hmm. visual that, like, you don't really get on acid. Like, I don't have a lot of open-eyed, massive hallucinations no. of things. That can happen on enough 2CI. Like, it's really potent visual hallucinations. Wow. It's rad. I love 2CI. And if you mix 2CI and... Um, how, long the it, hmm? like, how long does the high six, last? How long does the high last? Seven to eight hours. So like Like, a good mushroom trip or acid trip, essentially. Longer than mushrooms, a little shorter than acid. Mushrooms always always take forever to get out my system. I think everybody is different, but yeah. Yeah. Usually mushrooms for me are about three or four hours, but, um. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Lucky. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I love it. Anyway, I have a lot of fondness for e-gold because it brought a lot of wonderful drugs into my life as a, as a, as a kid. Um, Now, that said, it didn't last very long. It was actually shut down by the government in 2009 because the people running it had stopped getting the kind of licenses you need to transmit to be like to transmit money over the Internet, basically. Um, Again, it's this like they didn't believe they needed those licenses from the government. And the government said, well, yeah, you do. (laughs) So. Liberty Reserve, which operated from 2006 to 2013, was another attempt to make it possible for people to buy things anonymously over the Internet. The goal of all this anonymity was, for some people, just a matter of principle. They weren't actually doing anything sketchy. They just didn't want the government to know what they were doing. But for a lot of folks, man. Yeah, I get that. I do. Um, That said, for a lot of folks, it was a matter of wanting to buy illegal firearms, child pornography, or drugs, sometimes all three. Liberty Reserve was shut down when its founder... Okay, just the last one for me. Wow. Let's not put child pornography into the drugs, cat. That's not fair. And but weird. it is one of the things you would use untraceable money for. Like, those are kind of the big three. Okay, I hear you, but I want you to go, like... <laughs> I'm not drawing a moral equivalence between them. I know I'm just you're saying, not, like... <laughs> but I just don't want them to be in the same sentence. I'm offended no. as someone that just wants to have a good trip. Yeah, Versus I mean, that was that one of the things jack off to children. That is not the same vibe. No. And <laughs> even the uh, the Silk Road guy was like, well, I'm not going to let people sell child porn on the Silk Road. You can hire hitmen to murder people. But like, we're not we have we have standards. We have boundaries. <laughs> thank you. You can um, murder that guy full, was a huge... and full on adults, full ass adults. But when it comes to babies, no, mm-hmm. you yeah. save that for Robert and Sophia. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, but we won't molest them. Just kill them. Just kill them. Obviously, Just we're not them. monsters. And we're not monsters. Yeah, absolutely. So Liberty Reserve was shut down when its founder was imprisoned for 20 years for money laundering. Now, there's more to crypto history than that, but most of what you need to know after this point is that in 2007, Satoshi Nakamoto started working on Bitcoin. He was still following David Chaum's dream of a perfectly anonymous yet trustless digital currency. Bitcoin was also supposed to be like, you know, anonymous um, or was supposed to be anonymous. That's the reputation it has too. people say like, oh, Bitcoin transactions are anonymous. They're not really. And in fact, because of the blockchain, they're often very close to the opposite of anonymous. Every transaction is registered indelibly forever on an immutable chain. Um, so like one of the things about this is that there you could there is a way to do uh, totally anonymous Bitcoin transactions. If you number one, if you mind it, mind it on your own computer and get a Bitcoin, and you you know are reasonably secure with your machine, then people would see the transaction where it was going, um, but they wouldn't necessarily know that it was your Bitcoin. Also, some people buy Bitcoin like in person, like just hand someone cash for a hard drive with Bitcoin on it. That's fairly anonymous, but the, the transaction itself is not anonymous. It's literally the opposite. Everyone, including the feds, can see where Bitcoin is going, you know? Um, so if they know somebody is a drug dealer or, you know, uh, uh, doing something else illegal and they see Bitcoin coming to him and they can see that you owned that Bitcoin, then they know that you were paying that person, you know? Um, now the other thing is that one of, and this is again, part of the big selling point that the blockchain is, is immutable, that everyone can see every transaction. That is what makes it trustless, but it's actually not true that the blockchain is immutable. Um, the blockchain is decentralized. So it's basically what makes it supposedly immutable is that 
all of the different computers with a blockchain on it are constantly sharing the blockchains. And as long as they like most of them agree, that's the blockchain, right? So theoretically, if you have enough computers operating to make up more than 51% of the computers with the blockchain on it, kind of doing this decentralized sharing of the blockchain, you could change the blockchain. Um, and there are some, there are some groups with potentially the power to do this. I mean, maybe it's happened because there are these now big mining consortiums that, you know, operate hundreds of thousands of computers mining Bitcoin. And theoretically, they could actually modify the blockchain if they got like together enough people with enough of a goal to do that. But wait, modified Um, to what? To like alter, I don't know. Yeah, like to 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 either remove transactions or to like uh, you could you could fuck around in a bunch of different ways. If you if you had fifty one percent of like the computers that were kind of involved in this big distributed conversation, like there's all sorts of shit you could get up to. Um, but yeah, this is a little more detail than is necessary to understand the the grift nature of crypto. Because that's again theoretical. Are you saying that because my eyes glazed over, or because because <laughs> my eyes glaze over when I get too much into the technical that. stuff, or because um, Sophie literally fell asleep and I could just read her hat and nothing mm-hmm. else? Oh, cool. Oh yeah, she did fall asleep, huh? <laughs> Sophie, a, uh, get up. Uh, We're talking about the blockchain. I, I you must have said the word blockchain. In the last paragraph, fifty-two times. <laughs> I, I, like I, I look, I'm as word. frustrated by this as you are, but I, I'm setting up all this background because I want everyone to understand what an enormous, ridiculous grift that cryptocurrency has become since it got very popular. Um, because this story is funny, and instead of hashing out more technical details, I want to talk about Mount Gox now. But first, you gotta take an ad break, buddy. No, I refuse to. You have to okay. because I'll use one of my new fucking knives on you. All right. Yeah, no well, money I don't for you. Get stabbed by you. Good luck, <laughs> motherfucker. I got at least five of them. All right. Well, Ka-pow! here's. You know who won't stab you? Stab you. These goods and services, boy. Spoilers. They might. All right, we're back. And we're telling the tale of Mount Gox. Have you heard of Mount Gox? Probably not, but... What do you mean? Every, it's a, everything it's a, you say sounds like a bitch. I know. I'm just letting it's, you it's know. Came in me. Mount Gox was she the first big Bitcoin bank. Mount so, Gox, sorry. What? Mount Gox. It was the Gox? first big Bitcoin bank. So at one point, like a huge chunk of the Bitcoin being actively traded. I think a majority of it was like going through Mt. Gox. It was the big bank in the Bitcoin world, which obviously the whole thing is that like you were not going to need a bank. But the problem is that without a bank, again, if you like mistype an address, your Bitcoin just disappears forever. Like you have no security whatsoever. You have no safety. There's no way to like um, uh, actually uh, protect your money in any meaningful way. It can be hacked or stolen from you. So people started using exchanges, which are basically banks because they wanted the security that banks get, which is very funny because the whole idea was like, well, we have to get away from, you know, horrible banks. And then like we wound up reinventing banks, but because it's crypto, they wound up reinventing banks, but much worse. So Mt. Gox is the first big Bitcoin bank and its origin is hilarious. In 2007, a nerd named Jed McCaleb purchased the domain Mt. Gox, mtgox.com for his Magic the Gathering card trading website. <laughs> Mt. Gox stood for Magic the Gathering, o- the Gathering Online Exchange. In fact, it was not called Mt. Gox at all until Magic the Gathering proved less profitable than Jed had hoped. And so he like he the, the, he basically like stopped running the website. But then in 2010, there's a bunch of articles on Bitcoin. This is kind of the first big like boom period that Bitcoin has. So he reads a bunch of these articles and he's like, oh, I, may, I bet I could make a bunch of money off Bitcoin. And his his girlfriend likes the name of the we, like the URL of the website he has. So he just decides to relaunch his Magic the Gathering online exchange as Mt. Gox, a Bitcoin exchange in the hope that like, oh, that sounds like authoritative enough. I remember like on something awful following this as a kid and people being like when they realized the giant Bitcoin bank was <laughs> named after Magic the Gathering online exchange. Like, oh, what the fuck are you people doing? They're like, wait a minute. <laughs> this takes a little bit of the legitimacy out of this yeah. money. 
<laughs> oh yeah, and it's it's not legitimate at all, it turns out. So it was not long before Mt. Gox was the place to trade Bitcoin. It is highly possible that no other part of the story would have occurred without Mt. Gox. Um, because, again, Bitcoin's a giant pain in the ass to do on your own. This whole, like, have no bank, just peer-to-peer with no middleman is a huge pain in the ass that's super dangerous and, like, frustrating and annoying for people to do. And one of the things that's annoying about it is, so all of the transactions that Bitcoin has ever been involved in are stored on this ledger, right? The blockchain. Well, as time goes on, that means it gets bigger, right? Like by definition, the blockchain is always getting longer. And so by like 2011 or 12, it's like a hundred something gigabytes, which you have to keep on your computer if you want to do the transaction directly without a bank. I know it's such a pain in the ass. (laughs) Everything about it. Like your phone starts running out of room and you're just trying to take photos. Yeah. Like a meaningful occasion. And then you're like, no. And then you have to keep deleting shit. For your money. I don't know what's more important. Important, you know, my <laughs> Nana's birthday or mm-hmm. these margaritas with the girls. Bye, yeah. Nana. Click. Yeah, the genius of cryptocurrency is that it's provided <laughs> us all with a way to to take that feeling you get when your phone doesn't have space to take more pictures and apply it to spending money. <laughs> Oh, I don't like this. It makes me feel as irresponsible about money as I have always been. (laughs) Yeah. So Mt. Gox becomes huge um, and it, it allows for Bitcoin to expand massively because now it's not a pain in the ass. People can basically trade it like a it also it kind of allows commodity trading with Bitcoin. Right. Mt. Gox is where a lot of that starts, because before it had been so decentralized. Now there's this exchange. You can see the price of Bitcoin and like how it changes. People can short sell and whatnot. It, it, it allows Bitcoin to trade expand like massively. Gox. Trade mm-hmm. like my Gox. Yeah. To the tune of drop it <laughs> so, like it's hot. <laughs> well, that is what where the story's going, actually, because the, the, the spoilers, Mount Gox drops all of the Bitcoin that it's sta- <laughs> storing. <laughs> Drop it like Mount so, Gox. Drop it like Mount, Mount Gox. Gox is a Bitcoin or the price of Bitcoin grows steadily over the next year or so. Um, and McCaleb was smart enough to realize after a couple of years of this, that the platform had become something much more than just a hobby and that he was doing like, again, this starts as like, Oh, Bitcoin's neat. Like, let's see if I can set up an exchange to trade it. And very quickly he's dealing with like millions and then like tens of millions of dollars and is basically like kind of unlicensed trading securities and operating a bank, which is illegal. <laughs> so McCaleb being a smart guy is like, I should probably get the fuck out of this. Like, <laughs> this seems like it could be a problem for me. <laughs> and I, t- I maybe didn't entirely anticipate what, what, what was going to happen here. Now, he also had a problem in that tens of thousands of Bitcoin had gone missing or been stolen uh, from Mt. Gox, and he hadn't told anybody. Um, so he was basically like using new funds that were brought in to pay people out that had had the stolen bitcoins in the hopes that uh, nobody yes, would the notice classic it. Classic pyramid scheme. It is. It is a pyramid scheme. It like that keeps goes happening. Well, please ask <laughs> yeah. Lularo. And, uh, oh, McCaleb yes. is a really sketchy guy. I can't say that he was like actually had stolen those, but like I don't think we really know what happened to those bitcoin. No but one he was knows definitely if these like bitcoins fell off from the back of a <laughs> yeah. truck. But what we do know is, whoops. So the same year that happens, he sells Mount Gox to a guy named Mark Carpellas, um, and he doesn't tell him until the sale's done. They're like, oh, yeah, like 60,000 Bitcoin are missing. You got to keep playing this like shell game to hide that from everybody. Heads up. <laughs> got to drop it like it's hot if you're Mark Gox. No. Now, Mark, Mark Carpales is also a shady motherfucker. He'd been convicted of fraud himself a couple of years earlier. So, like, again, none of these victims are particularly sympathetic people either. But Carpales is, is he it's a bad deal for him. And so by the time he becomes aware of the fact that a lot of the Bitcoin the bank had been holding had been stolen, he basically agreed to assume all liability for this. As he continued to run <laughs> Mount Gox, yeah, it's, it's very it's funny. It's almost like buying a crew ship for your mm-hmm. crypto nation and then realizing oh fuck a lot is involved with running mm-hmm. a cruise ship and oh, i shit. do not know it's how hard to, to do be a it. bank 
<laughs> and as he's running Mount Gox, not only is he having to deal with like the fact that 60,000 Bitcoin are missing that he's trying to like cover in, in a variety of ways, he keeps getting hacked. The bank keeps getting hacked and more Bitcoin <laughs> keeps getting stolen because of like errors in the coding and stuff. People are just siphoning t- thousands and thousands of big Bitcoin. So when he realized like tens of thousands of more Bitcoin have been stolen, he panics and he takes the bank's assets offline and he puts them into what are called cold wallets. So a hot wallet is a is a crypto wallet that's online, right? And that means you can use it anytime you want to trade the money, but it also means that like a hacker could potentially get it. And if they get your wallet, they just have it and there's no way for you to get it back. It's just gone forever. Um, cold wallets are just like, basically he's just storing the, the files that are the cryptocurrency offline and something not connected to the internet, which is obviously the safest way to store it. But this again leads to this because he's unwilling to take any of these cold wallets and put them back online leads to this Ponzi scheme situation where like he's trying to bring in new money as quickly as he can to pay out the old money. So nobody notices that huge amounts of Bitcoin have been hacked. The other problem is that I think when the hack first happened, it was like tens of thousands of dollars worth of Bitcoin. But the price of Bitcoin increases so much so that eventually it it goes from like, oh, we're short like a hundred thousand or a couple hundred thousand dollars to like, we're short hundreds of millions of dollars. <laughs> like the problem expands <laughs> exponentially over time <laughs> because every time the price of Bitcoin increases, he's in the hole for more money. Hot um, wallet. <laughs> womp, womp, womp. Yeah. It's got a temperature. Hundred and three. <laughs> um so he uh uh this so yeah, it, it, it this is a, a bad situation. And for like the last couple of years he's running Mountain Gox, the bank is basically bankrupt and he's just like keeping it alive with nothing but lies. Um so I'm gonna quote from a write up in the next web here. On February 4th, 2014, Coindesk held a poll to find out how many Mt. Gox users had experienced withdrawal issues. In some cases, users still hadn't received their funds even weeks after they had requested withdrawal, which is great. Way better than a bank to ask to withdraw your money and not be allowed to for weeks because it all got stolen. A Bitcoin talk forum thread amassed Chase over three... Chase th- could never. <laughs> Chase could never. All those banks will do is destroy the entire global economy exactly. by gambling on real when estate. you can't get your money anytime you want. Please don't, please don't take us making fun of how dumb Bitcoin banks are. As, as like, any endorsement of Chase. No, or, or of any or bank. Any bank. Like, actual banks are dumb it's just a marker of how yes. dumb the crypto banks are that, that they're, they're even, even dumber, dumber than, than regular banks, banks. <laughs> yeah. yeah although obviously less toxic because when mount gox collapses spoilers it does not sink the entire global economy and leave tens of thousands of people homeless so that's that's good <laughs> uh good stuff on February 7th, 2014, Mt. Gox canceled all Bitcoin trading, froze accounts, and took a step back to take stock of what was actually going on. Ten days later, the exchange published a statement. It claimed it had rectified the situation and that it was now on course to correct customer losses and resume trade. But by the end of the month, Mark, Carpe- Mark Carpellas had stepped down from his role at the Bitcoin Foundation, and the firm's fate was sealed. It disclosed over 740,000 of users' Bitcoin, $2.9 billion in <laughs> today's value had been stolen in a hack that it claimed had been ongoing for years. At the time, that amount was valued at around half a billion dollars. On February 28th, 2014, the exchange accepted its fate and filed for bankruptcy in Tokyo. It would also file for bankruptcy in the U.S. later in March. Now, Bitcoin, again, had kind of sailed in this legal gray area, hadn't gotten a huge amount of government attention. That changes because like as silly as like crypto is to you know people in the fed or whatever when half a billion dollars goes missing law enforcement's going to be like well okay <laughs> wait a second here <laughs> what, what what happened here how did you lose half a billion a lot dollars of cops being like Ugh. yeah so this creates a problem um I'm, and there's like i will look into yeah. it 
Yeah, and there's after 18 months of like lawsuits and attempted like courts try to restructure the bank to get people some of their money, Carpellis is eventually arrested on embezzlement charges in August of 2015. Um, authorities claim that he manipulated Mt. Gox's computer programs in order to alter its balance sheet to artificially increase funds in one of its accounts. So he was not, his embezzlement was not him stealing money from Mt. Gox, it was him like lying about the money that was there in order to deal with the fact that there's this massive hole in it. Meanwhile, the founder of Mt. Mt. Gox has gone on to create a couple new different kinds of cryptocurrency and like continues to do that side of the grift. It's very funny. Um, Can I in please the end, find out what the names of the currency are? Because with Mount Gox is a starting mm-hmm. point. I'm just They're excited to see where it goes. They're forgettable, to be honest. Are they like um, the 90s names of like eCash or DigiCash no, or like, whatever the fuck? Like coin, whatever. I don't know. They're not They're not very exciting. Um, I can find them for you in a little bit if you like. Okay. So in, if they're not good, I trust you. In the end, Mountain Gox lost about 6% of all Bitcoin in existence at the time. Again, imagine if a bank disappeared 6% of the world's money supply. <laughs> like... <laughs> It's very funny. Some of it was later recovered, but more scandals followed. Um, and and that's so. There, and there have been like other exchanges, like a bunch of like there was one exchange that had a map because they keep getting hacked. Right. So there was one exchange that was based on an exchange that had initially been coded by a 16 year old Chinese kid. Um, and people liked it because it had a good user interface, but it was really bad code. And it was never meant to deal with like hundreds of millions of dollars in transactions. But that's what happened. And there were a bunch of exploits and hackers stole like tens of thousands of of bitcoin and like made away with millions and what that exchange did was tell everybody hey so that we can make whole the the rich people who were robbed we're taking 37 percent of everybody's bank account (laughs) <laughs> like Whoa. you just have to accept that like they're all like like horrible grifts <laughs> like all of these fucking exchanges um Who some of them the have gotten a bit better out? now mark like mark but, mark mark yeah i mean if you're being totally fair like you could be like well yeah a lot all of the early bitcoin exchanges and crypto exchanges were giant horrible grifts but like look at what banks were like in like the 1880s uh where they would just like run out of their clients money and everybody would be fucked and there would be runs on the bank it's like yeah you know that is fair like um the problem is like to what benefit are you recreating the financial system and all of the problems inherent in creating an entirely new financial system? I haven't found anyone who's actually been able to give a thing that's Crack it. Yeah. good it, that they're doing. It'd be sick if anybody did. Yeah. Um, so uh, in 2015, a new cryptocurrency, Ethereum, is released. Um, Ethereum is much more advanced than Bitcoin, um, and it can handle like more transactions. It's it's uh, you know it was made. Uh, like almost a decade later. So there's a lot of things that about Ethereum are smarter. Its main claim to fame, which are are called smart contracts. And a smart contract is basically a program that is stored on the blockchain that executes um, when you like do a transaction. Yeah, it's it's like a, 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 a program that you like store on the blockchain. And so it can't be changed or altered. And the idea behind this is that you could use these to make perfectly equitable contracts. Like one of the marketing terms is like, hey, imagine if a musician could actually hold a record account uh, company accountable to the contract they signed because it's immutable and it's on the blockchain everybody can see it the problem is that number one contracts are only as good as their coding so if they're coded wrong then the whole thing could be a disaster the other thing is that like well the problem with inequitable contracts isn't that like they're hidden it's that the people who write contracts are able to like have lawyers that can write them in ways to fuck people over and you maybe don't understand it and there's no reason why ethereum smart contracts would suddenly render someone immune to a record company having more resources to figure out how to fuck people over on a contract it just doesn't make a whole lot of sense um the other problem is that like as you know, in the entertainment industry, often you have a contract and then you have to renegotiate and like change it later. And because it's immutably on the blockchain, that's kind of hard to do with smart yeah. contracts. They're not very smart is the problem. Um, you could argue that like an agreement you make with human beings at a company you work for and have a contract for is much smarter because you can go to them and say like, hey, actually, I want to change this part of my contract. Can we alter that and then sign a new contract? Which I've done. Like, I know a lot of people who have. Not that like there aren't horrible like abusive contracts that's constant but like it is 
I, I don't think the way Ether is trying to do it is any smarter. And obviously, most of what smart contracts have been used to do is create automatic Ponzi schemes. Um, and like, like, like Ponzi schemes that execute automatically is like matters of code. Um, there's a ton of different Ponzi's. And in fact, like people knowingly get involved in Ponzi schemes in the crypto world in the understanding that like, well, if I'm early enough, then I'll make some money off of it. Yeah, exactly. As long as I'm yeah. not the one getting fucked over and I'm fucking yeah. someone else over... That's the American way. Yep, yep. And there's a bunch of, like, there have been cases with these smart contracts where, like, the coding of the contract is bad, um, and it creates an opportunity because there's a hole in the coding for, like, hackers to steal millions and millions of Ether or, or, or whatever. Um, and this has happened a couple of times. And when it's happened in, like influential people like people who had helped make ethereum like lost money um they actually were able to create correct those errors like it's the, the thing i said where if you have like a, a high enough amount of the processing power you can alter the blockchain basically um shit like that has been done when like the whales lose money um it's just not going to be done if you lose all your money because you're nobody um which is cool so you're you're recreating the part of the financial system wherein the rich make all the rules and get to change the rules if they lose money yep. um which is also fun now you'll note that i have not talked a lot about the environmental consequences of cryptocurrency we'll talk about that a bit um but even without that like if you separate the environmental consequences it's just all such a giant obvious fucking scam and to make that point i want to talk about the case of bitcoin savings and trust which was created by a guy who went online by a name inspired by a jimmy buffett song pirate at 40 so th this guy who's creating Bitcoin savings and trust oh, no. he identifies himself as a pirate, which is going to be meaningful in a minute. So Pirate at 40 that promised huge returns. That doesn't even look returns. good on Johnny Depp. Get out no. of here. No, not anymore, for sure. Um, he promised huge returns on people's investments, and he collected as much as half a million Bitcoin, worth $5.6 million at the time and worth like all of the money in the world now. Any reasonable investor would have known that like the rate of return Pirate at 40 was promising uh, marked him out as a scammer. But this was Bitcoin um, and people didn't think that way. Uh, there were folks who called him off online and like forums and stuff, and they were downvoted essentially um, and lost online clout in the community for being negative about what was obviously such a great investment opportunity. <laughs> why are you, why don't, why are you being negative about crypto, bro? Like we don't need that kind of thinking here. Uh, in the end, this very obvious Ponzi scheme wound up in control of 7% of all Bitcoin in circulation at the time. Um, and it, it was a giant scam. Pirate at 40 like disappeared with everybody's fucking money um now he was caught in this case because again these people are now committing financial crimes large enough for like to be paid attention to um and some of the money was returned but this was just the start of what would prove to be a long chain of bitcoin crimes and incompetence bitomat at one time the third largest exchange for bitcoin existed for months before it was revealed that they had kept the site's whole wallet file which is all of everybody's money oh on God. an amazon web services cloud file that did not have a backup and was set to ephemeral so if it was restarted if the servers were restarted the wallet was deleted and everybody's money disappeared forever, which is no. exactly what happened in July of 2011. No, I would be so <laughs> mad. My bank forgot to have a backup of our money. Sorry, oh, guys. My God. Bitcoinica was the project of a 16 year old who was pretty good at coding and tried to make an exchange. It collapsed in 2012 without any database backups. All its remaining funds disappeared after a series of hacks due to the fact that the admins used the same password for Bitcoinica that they had used for Mt. Gox, which had been hacked months earlier, revealing the password and allowing hackers to steal everything. This is I so could fucking go on. stupid. Why would you have it, a teenager do this? Well, and this 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 bit Bitcoinica, which collapses, the code that it was was made by this teenager for it was then used by that other exchange, the one I told you about that got robbed and took thirty seven percent of everybody's money. Like it's such stupid fucking bullshit. No one's it's learning such stupid anything. fucking bullshit. And you know what else is stupid fucking bullshit, Sophia? These goods and services. No, NFTs. Oh, and we're okay, going to talk about NFTs in part two of this episode. But for right now, I want to talk about something that's not bullshit, Sophia. Your pluggables. Wow. Thank you so much. Um, You're welcome you so much. Find me on Twitter and Instagram. Find her on Twitter. At on Instagram. The Sophia. S O F. At the Sophia. I Y A. 
I Y A. And you can listen to my two podcasts, <laughs> Private Parts Unknown, about love and sex around the world, mm-hmm. and 420 Day Fiance with Miles Gray, where we mm-hmm. um, do stoned recaps of 90 Day Fiance. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. And you can find me uh, on Bitcoin.scam, where I am, <laughs> just send me $350. And if everybody does that, I will give you guys Robert coin, uh, wow, which exists in your hearts. So no exchange necessary. You don't have to have an exchange. It's in your heart. You just know you send me 350 bucks. You've got a Robert coin. And uh, then I'm going to retire. I'm, I'm just going to go. That's the episode. (laughs) That's the episode.